good morning and welcome. Uh, I'm seeing that a few of you had trouble connecting this morning. I'm glad that you were able to make it and apologize for any inconvenience. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for the Military Families Learning Network, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session. This learning opportunity is brought to you by the Family Development Early Intervention Concentration Area of the Military Families Learning Network. Webinar resources, including the webinar slides, can be found at learn.extension.org slash events forward slash 2940 under event materials at the bottom of the page. Additionally, if you have need of tech support during today's webinar, please email us at milfamln at gmail.com. This address, along with the link I just mentioned, is located in the important info pod to the lower right-hand corner of this page. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD-USDA partnership for military families, connecting military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research into each other through engaging online learning opportunities. You can explore more about our communities and resources at eextension.org, or pardon me, militaryfamilies.extension.org. Finally, the MFLN is active on Facebook and Twitter, and we host an archive of our professional development sessions on YouTube. We do invite you to check these out. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Robin DiPietro Wells with the Early Intervention Team. Thanks, Robin. Good morning. My name is Robin DiPietro Wells, and I'm the Social Media and Webinar Coordination Specialist for the MFLN Family Development Early Intervention Team. Our goal is to help support and enhance the skills of professionals serving military families who have young children with developmental delays and or disabilities. Today, we're very excited to introduce Dr. Christy Pretty Franzak. Christy received her Master's and PhD in Special Education Early Intervention from the University of Oregon. Following that, she spent 16 years as faculty at Kent State University, and she now trains and coaches early educators worldwide. Christy defines herself as a speaker, author, and researcher devoted to revolutionizing early childhood education. She seeks to cultivate real change within educational organizations by helping early educators transform practice. Right before I turn things over to Christy, I'm going to ask our audience to complete just a really quick poll for us. You'll notice that a gray box popped up on your screen. If you could please click on, click on your affiliation, keeping in mind you might need to scroll down the screen a bit to find your category. So we'll give you just a few seconds to go ahead and do that. Just a couple more seconds, and then we'll take that down. OK. All right, thank you. At this time, you might want to get a pen and paper to take notes as you follow along with today's presentation. And I will now mute my microphone and turn it over to Christy to begin, begin the presentation. All right, there you go. I was uh, thinking I was all fancy and then I couldn't unmute myself, but here we go. So hi, everyone. I am so glad that you were able to join me. For those who may be listening to this as a recording, um, fabulous that you found us. And I hope that um, through this experience, the next 90 minutes, we all um, can just take a breath and uh, not multitask. Uh, those of you who might be driving, that you're not looking at the screen, um, but that you just take a minute to really think about and um, explore with me today uh, the power of play. So uh, again, welcome, and just a couple of things about my background. Um, thank you, Robin, for the introduction. And um, so glad to see some familiar um, faces. I'm doing that in air quotes, and you can't see me um, from the chat. So thank you, and um, good to see some good friends. So um, I currently live in Ohio, and um, but I was raised in Idaho, and I hang out in Iowa a lot. So some of you know that I often introduce myself as being from Idaho, Ohio. Um, it took me a long time to learn how to say it, so I say it often. But for some people, it's a little confusing what these different states that all sound alike um, are. And so um, 
it also sort of just depicts that um, I kind of have this expansive um, opportunity to meet people all over the place. And so it doesn't really matter whether you're in Idaho, Iowa, Ohio, or overseas. Um, we all have some similar desires uh, to see our children thrive. And we all face different challenges. And our military families, in particular, um, face some unique challenges uh, or maybe some heightened challenges that um, I hope today we can um, find some solutions for in terms of just bolstering, supporting, cultivating, and nourishing um, all of our families, and in particular, our um, military families. I often show pictures of um, the view from an airplane, because I'm often on an airplane. So if you're looking at your screen, you'll see my little Idaho, Ohio comic, and you'll see a picture outside of an uh, airplane. You'll also hear me talk a lot about shark music. Um, we might get to that a little bit today, too. Um, but it's a little bit about like what makes you nervous. And so when we go on home visits, when we um, are working with a child with um, maybe some challenging play skills, like usually kids love to play with us. And we've got this one kid that we're serving that we go up to them and they're like, oh, I'm out, right? And that causes us what we call shark music. It's like, hey, I'm really fun to play with. Um, but families can hear shark music too. Um, they can be stressed about any number of things and for a family that might be um, going through deployment for the second or third time, even knowing what to expect can still cause shark music about what is this going to mean for our family. Um, there could be financial, there could be relationship issues. And so how do we kind of turn down the shark music in our day-to-day -day realities and really allow for opportunities for us to play? And then lastly, as Robin mentioned, um, one of my big things is about the revolution. And this actually comes from Grace Lee Boggs' work. And the R is in parentheses because the um, emphasis is on evolution. And so my hope for today is that we all evolve in our thinking about the importance of play and then how we become good play partners. So I thought it'd be fun, speaking of play, to think back down memory lane. Now, for some of us, this it's going to be a little bit hard. It might cause shark music because um, <laughs> we can't remember what we had for breakfast. Um, some of you might be eating breakfast and not even noticing what you're having for breakfast. But if you're looking at your screen, there's a couple of prompts. And so I really want you to use the chat today to talk to each other, to talk to me, um, certainly to get tech support um, and to get access to things, but also just to be engaged so that you don't get kind of distracted as I ramble and go check your email or see if there's something more interesting on Facebook or Pinterest, but that you kind of stay here with this collective. Um, and then for those of you who are listening to it recorded, maybe just pause the recording for a minute and I want you to think about a couple of things. So. What was your favorite thing to do or play with when you were a kid? For those of you who are young, you may not have to think back that far. So for some of us, it's going to be way back in our memory. Uh, some of us might even actually remember playing until it was dark outside when our parents would say, come on in, right? Um, maybe even what was your favorite toy? And so I see some people um, marking what their favorite was. And I'm going to put mine um, up there as well. It was this vacuum that made noise. Now, this is like 1973, maybe. <laughs> so now I'm dating myself. Um, those of you who are saying things like rollerblades are, yeah, uh, yeah, much younger. But those of you who like Chrissy dolls, ah, you are my generation, right? So people are talking about that they love to play school and they love to play outside and they love to do anything that was like with Barbie and Ken. Well, I have this vacuum and we were living in Salt Lake City, Utah at the time. And my dad encouraged me to bring my vacuum in for repairs. And I remember this like it was yesterday. So speaking of trauma, this is not real life trauma, but this was traumatic to me. So I took my little vacuum cleaner in and my dad <laughs> fixed it air quotes again. And what he did was he took the sound out because it was driving everybody in my family crazy. And so here I am thinking I'm going to take this favorite toy of mine into the shop and this is great and the vacuum repair guy is going to fix it. And, you know, then my dad sabotaged it. So I've been traumatized ever since then. But anyway, it's just kind of a fun memory for me and my family to joke about. Um, and then you might even think about what was the riskiest thing you did when you were a kid. And it's always fun to think about, did your mom, your dad, your grandma, 
grandma, your aunt, whoever was your caregiver, do they know to this day that you did that? For those of you who have children, this will cause shark music because you're like, oh crap, my kids are doing stuff that I don't know about or I do, don't want to know about, right? So yeah, like climbing trees and doing all kinds of things that, you know, now we kind of like, oh, be careful, watch that, right? So um, keep them coming, uh, mar you know, in the chat, keep thinking about, it. it'll spark this positive emotional attractor, this good memory, um, this, this idea of um, exploring and being creative and not knowing what was going to happen, and um, this so important imaginary play, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into the webinar, but I thought it'd be kind of fun just to kind of... Um, go back through memory lane and have an opportunity. And so if you um, are scrolling through the chat, you might see if people had shared interest. If you're kind of still wondering, like, well, is this webinar worth it for my hour and a half today? Or you've started to push play and you're like, should I fast forward? Um, let me tell you why you might want to hang out today. Or if you do want to fast forward, if you're listening to this recorded, which chunks you might be most interested in. So certainly have um, objectives, but really this is about like, why is this webinar for you? Why would you care? Why will it help you? Um, how will it help you help the families that you work with? And so the idea is that we really want to speak with a louder voice that play is so critical. I had a colleague email me the other day saying that she had been um, encouraged, asked, told, who knows what the verb was, to resign um, her position because she wasn't getting kids ready for kindergarten. And my heart just sort of broke for her because it was this idea that um, what's more important is uh, a child's reading score versus a child's um, ability to be creative and to play and to be in, in, in this prolonged play. And more and more, especially for many of our military families, the pace at which we live our lives, there may not be these um, sacred opportunities to to climb these trees and play with Barbie and Ken and to play with our caregivers. And there's some real reasons why that is um, a challenge. And so part of today is to explore and remind ourselves the importance of play and how can we bring that back, even if it's just a little tiny bit. Um, so it doesn't have to be um, causing more shark music. So thanks to my friends in Illinois who I met last week where we were talking about shark music. We don't want to cause more shark music for families who are just trying to keep it together as we all are and say, now you have to play with your kid. But we're really remembering how important it is. And so what are little ways we can cultivate that in the smallest step possible? Another reason that we're hanging out today is to really remind ourselves of the sequences, the milestones, the progression. Um, the trajectories of play so that when a kid gets stuck in that loop of play that we're able to help them get unstuck. And we'll dive deeper into other webinars in this series about kids with diverse abilities, but we'll touch on it a little bit today. And that'll bring us to that third one, um, you know, Vygotsky called it the zone of proximal development. I call it the sweet spot. It's this play level that's just right. Like how many of you have ever been interacting with a baby? and you're making faces, and the baby's cooing and kind of imitating your facial expressions. expressions. And then the baby, um, you know, turns away. And it's like, oh, baby needs a break. And if you're, you know, in tune with the baby, you don't go, oh, the baby doesn't want to play with me anymore. You're like, ah, the baby needs a break. And so you pause and you take a break. And then when the baby turns back to you, you um, start that game again. And that's what we mean by Play, but we have to really think about that zone of proximal development. Is that child really ready for me to keep going? Is that child ready for me to expand that cooing with some language, um, maybe some um, motor coordination that's tied into it so they can imitate a common motor action as well? Am I stressing the child by doing too much too soon? So we'll talk about that. And then maybe my favorite part, so again, those of you listening to this recording, Recorded, if you want to fast forward to the end, um, it's really to deepen our commitment. And so it's really going to take all of us standing up with a very strong voice saying that what is most important is that I foster strong relationships, that I, as in my role, whether that be a service provider, whether that be an occupational therapist, a physical therapist, a speech, thing, speech and language pathologist, 
a play specialist, a brain architect, right? It doesn't matter. Um, but it's this fabulous way to say that I'm committed to fostering strong relationships and helping children thrive. And so hopefully today what you'll walk away with is, um, you know, cha you know, combating that push down all of the pressure and helping our families remove some of the stresses wherever we can in the smallest of ways to help children um, really uh, thrive. So uh, I like to channel Oprah. I like to think I'm Oprah, but I'm really not. But I like to channel her every once in a while. So I'm going to walk you through, as Oprah would say, 10 things that I know for sure. And so as I walk through them, there's just going to be visuals. Um, there's not text. And so you might want to make a note of a key word. And at the end of the 10, we're going to have another prompt for the chat for you to think about um, what of those 10 things are a takeaway. They reinforce something that you've always known. They make you feel stronger. You can certainly chat while we go. But just know that I'm going to tell you 10 things that I know to be true about play. And this is just sort of getting to that first objective in terms of really thinking about um, the importance of play. And then we're going to explore an infographic together. So um, that will be a little interactive for you as well. So the first thing I know for um, to be true, to be what I believe in every day, is that play really does follow a progression. And so what is important for us as um, play partners, as brain architects, as developmental specialists, as moms, as dads, as grandmas, as aunts, um, that it's really important that we think about where is this child? How are they moving from something that's more simple to more complex? And really when it comes to play and we think about being self-regulated, which can be a huge barrier to being able to play, is that we move from being externally regulated to internally regulated. So what are we doing every day to find that sweet spot and help a child along the progression, particularly for a child who's gotten stuck? And we'll talk a bit about stressors um, from Stuart Shanker's work um, with self-reg about what stressors keep a child from moving along that progression. The second thing I know for sure about play and development is that it's highly variable. So I'll quickly walk us through some of the very traditional ways that we um, have ages and stages of play. But really, those go out the window because so many children will tell us what their sequence is. So there's sort of this paradox. There is a sequence, but then each child's on their own journey. and. As a child gets older, the variability of when children will do certain things gets bigger. So I can't say every kid will have cooperative play by three years, three months, and three days, right? So it's sometime during the early years, you'll get cooperative play. So it's our job to really think about um, what does that variability mean. The third thing is that we actually have little control over making things happen faster. So even that um, dear friend of mine who was asked to resign because she wasn't getting kids ready for kindergarten, A, the amount of power that she has to actually wield readiness is minimal. And secondarily, there's no advantage. In fact, we know there are disadvantages to rushing development. So this idea of having, of having things happen faster or sooner um, doesn't actually lead to more responsive um, and thriving adults later in life. We don't have the control to speed things up in development, and actually we have um, suggestions that it actually does harm. So the fourth thing is that, um, right on the piggyback of that, that there's really no advantage to try to speed up or slow down development. Some of you have kids who might be graduating this spring um, from the eighth grade or from high school or from college, you might be like, oh, it's going so fast. But, you know, we really don't have that control, and there's very few um, advantages. So, for example, how many of you, uh, a point of pride, is that you were an early walker? So you can put that in the chat, like, yeah, I was an early walker in my family. Woohoo! Well, now how's that working out for you, right? Uh, very few of you that will raise your hand and say, yes, I was an early walker are now marathon runners or Olympians. I wish you were, right? Maybe you wish you were. But most of us just kind of like walk at a normal pace. It doesn't matter how early in our lives we walked. We all kind of learn to walk eventually, which is just good enough. Number five. 
if we want kids to develop and grow and learn and um, thrive, we really have to give them multiple and varied learning experiences. So we really need to think about um, what are we doing every day to be more mindful that we're creating these multiple and varied learning opportunities. And so we want to think about um, how do we help support families to create multiple and varied learning opportunities, things that might be obvious to us, um, but we don't know quite what um, uh, but a caregiver may not be so obvious to them. So someone had asked just quickly about the shark music. So here's another example of shark music. It's really, you might be too young, um, some of you, to know Jaws, which I'm like, oh, really? You're too young to know what the movie Jaws was? But it's this idea of dun dun, dun dun, dun dun, dun dun, right? So you hear this um, impending doom. And so even when I say you have shark music around something, let's say I say to you, help a family find multiple and varied learning experiences so that they can, um, you know, help their kid really grow and prosper. You might hear shark music, meaning it makes you concerned. You're not so sure um, what to do because this family is in crisis. This family is in survival. This family is doing the very best they can. So who are you to come in? Maybe you are of a different culture, of a different language, of a different generation. How are you to really tell them what should be multiple and varied? Maybe this simple, simple thing they do every day is part of their routine and good enough. So it's that paradox between wanting more and wanting to, you know, actually honor where a family is. So number six, um, these later steps that kids go through, these milestones, they become more complex and fully integrated. So what that means is, is that kids don't learn things in isolation. So if you really want to know um, how to get a red kid ready for kindergarten, and really look at their symbolic play. Symbolic play, language, and cognition are so interwoven, especially in the first three years of life, that you can't tease them apart. You can't just work on one body part. You really need to see that things are um, becoming more complex with development, and things are really becoming fully integrated. And of course, I haven't been moving along my images. Sorry, um, I'm just rambling here by myself um, to think about what is... Um, really what is um, uh, interwoven and interconnected. And so on your screen here, I'll get you some better slides. You've been all looking at the same thing for a few times, but I think it'll catch right up here with me. Um, but the idea is to really think about um, interwoven. That's what made me remember. Um, the seventh one is that um, earlier stages sort of remain a part of kids' repertoire. So if I said to you, as you learn to talk in longer utterances, how many of you gave up the word no? So I would say, have you given up your use of the word no? And most of you would say no, <laughs> right? So you'd be proving my point that um, number seven is that even as we get more complex and we get more skills and we can talk, as you can see, I can, in long utterances, we still use those early core skills. And so when we think about promoting play, we're not always trying to get to a higher, more sophisticated level. Sometimes we pause. Sometimes we go back. Sometimes we um, return to something familiar. So we'll talk about that a little bit as well. And number eight, um, and you'll start to see these themes, right? So even though I'm on the eighth thing, they all kind of go together. The early learning is highly um, dependent and interrelated with development. So some people talk about early learning. Some talk about early development. It's all interwoven. And so this notion that you can um, really get, let's say, um, math skills without play skills is a myth, right? Because you need to learn content areas as much as you need to have developmental domains. It's all one body. That brings us quickly to number nine, that development, you know, is so fast and so furious in these first three years of life, certainly in the first five years of life, certainly in the first eight years of life. Oh, right. It's a developmental thing. It goes forever. And so 
um, this idea that there's only this small window or that we don't keep learning or that um, we're done learning, we really have to understand what's going on in the brain and how so much of that is happening in the first three months of life, three years of life, um, three decades of life. It's totally a progression. So it's fast and furious, but it's really a lifelong process. So as we think about play today, I want you to even think about where are you in your developmental progression of play? Have you sort of hit a plateau? You don't really play that much anymore. You sort of have the same ideas of play. You haven't really thought about what play looks like in this chapter of your life. So sometimes it's kind of fun to think about your own development, not just the development of those we serve. So that brings us to number 10. I know I'm going fast. I have lots of things I want to share with you today. So hopefully you're catching some key words. And now that I'm moving my slides, hopefully the images are helping you um, make some connections. So development at any age should not be measured by a single dimension um, or in a yes, no sort of way. So do you have play skills, yes or no? Um, do you have uh, readiness, yes or no? Do you have um, motor skills, yes or no? That's what we mean by binary. And when we think about your development, are you on track? Are you struggling? Are you off track? It really should be something about um, this idea of all the dimensions that go into it. So we want to really think about development as any age, not as being mastered, but really being something that is in progress. And so um, Jen has asked a good question that um, we can stop and pause here for just a second and think about, um, is play any different among military kids? And so, so the easy answer um, to that is yes and no, right? Ha, huh, how's that easy? Um, because of the unique stressors that many of our military families face in terms of um, moving quite often in terms of uh, being uh, with a family member that is maybe a veteran and has post-traumatic stress disorder or maybe losing a loved one or even just something as, and I'm using big air, air quotes, um, divorce or um, loneliness or depression. These are things that families across um, environments face, but there's sort of this heightened uh, or increased frequency when we serve military families. So being aware of the stressors um, that I'll talk about here in a minute will um, needs to be in our forefront because it's not like if these stressors are at play, that they are at play so that many of our families um, that are in the military will have these stressors. It's not a matter of whether or not they do. It's kind of a given. So we have to be careful that we think about that play can be um, compromised uh, with young children, both in their relationships with their caregivers, as well as that progression can be impacted. So it's not so much that it's different. It just can be negatively or um, it, there can be challenges that we need to be aware of. So on that note, you've got a prompt on the slide. If you're not looking at the slide, let me give you a few of the prompts. What we'd like you to do, you could certainly, yeah, some of you that are thinking of migrant families, um, I would say there's a great parallel between families that are migrant families in the United States and military families in terms of that um, uh, mobility, um, financial stresses, um, fears, uh, some of those same um, parallels can be found. So. I went through 10 things quickly. Which of these 10 things are sort of resonating with you the most? So the, that one, there's a sort of logical sequence to development, and I need to be aware of that so I can see when a kid gets stuck or where they are in that sweet spot. Another one is that development's highly variable including play. So knowing that there's a, a delay, a disability or disorder, I have to be really in tune with my team to know if this is really just a difference, either cultural, linguistic, temperament versus a disability delay or disorder. Um, and that play is highly variable. It's going to go at its own pace. So we're not going to be here to speed it up. We're not going to be here to try to slow it down. Um, that we're going to be here to create multiple and varied learning experiences. And that play, like all parts of development, is really complicated and it's really um, dependent upon all my other body parts. 
if my hands have trouble, as my OTs would know, if I have trouble bilateral motor coordination, bringing my hands to midline, that's going to compromise my play. If I have a vision um, impairment, it's going to impede my um, curiosity to explore my environment. If my little body is so dysregulated and so stressed out by sounds, I'm going to have trouble processing um, the interactions that are coming in from a verbal way. So as you think about it, people are doing a great job posting um, which one of these 10 things. Uh, it's a lifelong process maybe for some of you. Maybe that sparked your own curiosity like, hey, when is the last time I've sort of given myself permission to play? So on that note, I would love it, even though I told you not to multitask, if any of you have your calendar open, if any of you are old school and still have a paper planner, I would love you to look at your life in the next two days, five days, ten days, and I want you to schedule an appointment to play. It can be any way you define play. But I would love it, and if you're listening to this recording, pause it now, find your calendar, and make a date to play. It can be with somebody. It can be solitary play. It can be two minutes. It can be two days, right? But I would love it if you would think of play as a lifelong process and think of an opportunity to play. So good. I love that people are sharing things in the chat. Uh, keep them coming, and for those of you who have found your calendar, I hope you have, and I hope that you will revisit um, our Facebook page uh, for military families or my page and share what you did on that date that you made to play. If you want a little bit of um, accountability, you can be like Stephanie and others, and you can say, hey, I'm playing bingo on Saturday, and so great. Good idea. Go for it, right? So um, anything, yeah, that is relaxing, right, and is enjoyable, um, that's the same for children as for adults. It doesn't have to be with toys. It doesn't have to be defined by us. So here's a quick quote as you're all making your date with play um, from our National Association for the Education of Young Children. Um, that I want you just to embrace this. It's me reading a quote to you, but just to Take a breath for just a minute and think about the power behind this quote. And then we're going to dig into an infographic that you can take with you um, that can help you promote the power of play. So from NAEYC, play is an important vehicle for developing self-regulation as well as promoting language, cognition, and social competence. Children of all ages love to play, and it gives them opportunities to explore the world, interact with others, express and control emotions, develop their symbolic and problem-solving skills, and practice emerging skills. Research shows the link between play and foundational capacities such as memory, self-regulation, oral language, social skills, and success in school. It's like if you're looking for the magic bullet, if you're like, how do we help kids? How do we um, do what's best? It's this four-letter word. It's play. Now, is there tons of pressure against us fighting? And again, as we come back and think about our military families, are there barriers, challenges? Yes. And so we take a breath. We let the shark music kind of subside, and we go, okay, then what can I do to help this family identify something that's enjoyable, something that is relaxing, something that allows them to have permission to take a breath? Um, so it's those sorts of things um, that we can um, put in the forefront when we make a home visit, when we're interacting, when we see families. If we could even just slow down, we've created a little bit of space for us all to enjoy our time together, and that's a form of play. So if you um, are on the um, extension.org website for today, you will see one of our handouts is this infographic. If you have trouble uh, finding the infographic, someone will put the direct URL in the chat. They can help you find it. Um, but my colleague Ashley Lyons and I um, made a little infographic that, if you don't know what an infographic is, just quickly, it's sort of taking facts and figures and 
graphics, images, and putting them together. And we wanted to convey that um, play is important and play goes across the lifespan. And so in our infographic, there are different sections and you will see um, facts and figures, um, depending on how you know far in the future some of you are listening to this, um, the, the facts and figures are current, meaning you know 2015, 2016, 2017. If you're listening to this recording way in the future, this might sound really old school and you really may not know what JAWS is, but the idea is, is to give you something that um, is easy to consume, easy to process, that reminds you of the research behind behind the power of play. So if you have a minute, you can pause the recording. If you are multitasking, you can open up a new window and find that link to the learn.extension.org and um, check out the infographic. And as I'm kind of talking and moving us along, if people find a way that they want to use that infographic in their own work, share it in the chat so that we can all learn from your ideas and say, um, given my role in, um, you know, as a speech therapist, as a home visitor, as a consultant, as a teacher, as a grandparent, whatever your role is, um, how would you see yourself using that infographic? And I'll just pause for a second, take a breath, oh, that's good for me, and let you find the infographic, scroll through it a little quickly, and then again, if you don't have a chance to look at it today, no worries, take a look at it down the road. Um, and then come back to Facebook or to Twitter and share how you have used the infographic. So fabulous. Some of my friends online are saying they're going to use it um, at parent education night. So it's something that you can talk or walk through, um, that you can use it with your staff, uh, certainly use it with pre-service teachers, right? They get all of this content, but how often do we remind them that their job is to be a champion of play? Yeah, so um, I'm looking at the chat here. Definitely you all can and have my permission to uh, open up this big old infographic. Um, you're right, Loretta, it kind of is, um, or whoever said that, it kind of is this big long one. Um, uh, Robin, you're, maybe you were saying, what I'll do is I'll also help chunk it um, so that you have it but you can also take screenshots of it and chunk it yourself so that if you want to make it um, into a PowerPoint or into a handout that's a little bit more consumable, um, we'll help you with that as well. But you have my permission to um, reuse it any way that helps you. Great. Yeah, so definitely people that are using the theme, um, they're saying in parent education and parent support, um, allowing parents to be able to consume this in maybe bite-sized ways, because we're not going to all go read uh, the Journal of Early Intervention, though you all should. Um, uh, have access to that as members of the Division for Early Childhood. So there's my little plug for DEC today. So we're moving on, but as you have ideas, put it there. If you need something from me or from my colleagues um, that are hosting the webinar today, just reach out and we'll make sure that you have what you need. So this, this is our next kind of transition to a next big chunk of content. And this is really thinking about, um, do I Peter Pan believe in the power of play? And so I love to say Peter Pan believe because when you have that belief, that way back, that innocence that we had, that anything was possible, you know, you could actually fly until we, you know, learned about physics and people said, get out of that big tree, you're going to fall and break your crown, right? Until we instilled fear, we Peter Pan believed in things. And so often in this age of accountability, um, we've sort of lost our Peter Pan belief in the power of play. And so I really want to start thinking a little bit about the ways that we can strengthen our Peter Pan beliefs. And I'm going to give you two ways to Peter Pan believe in something. So you might have to dig deep to resurrect this belief. Some of you might live this every day. Um, and people might even call you Pollyanna. Um, 
which is actually a side note. Um, some of us that were in Colorado and Illinois last week uh, talked about the positive emotional attractor. And this is this uh, research coming out of Case Western Reserve that when we can trigger people's strengths, you know, we've all been strength-based in early intervention for years, but when we can actually trigger the strengths of someone, they actually become more open to change, they become more able to change, they become able to really see things in a better problem-solving light, a, a forward motion. So these people in our lives that have been Pollyanna or Peter Pan Believe actually have been allowing all of us to evolve and move forward by building on our strengths. So the first way is that we're going to strengthen our relationships. And so what does that mean? And what does that mean especially for family members who are deployed or are in the process of being deployed or family members um, that are veterans who might have either mental or physical injuries of some sort, um, those that are, again, visible and invisible to us? This is a, this is a, a, a tension that we have to hold with some compassion, that we want to promote relationships, um, but we also don't want to cause shark music. So hold this tension with me that as I tell you how important it is, um, to foster relationships that we do in such a way that builds on the strength of the person wherever they are. So if that's a dad, a mom, uh, a grandparent, a child care provider, whomever we're trying to build a relationship with, um, know that there might be stressors that will, you know, fight this and we just have to hold that tension. So let's first work from a strength base. Let's promote that positive emotional attractor. And then let's talk a little bit about the realities of the stressors that many of our families are facing. And then our job becomes to first remove any stressor that we are able to, and then we can come back to fostering the relationship. So I first learned about the toothpaste theory um, from the Frank uh, from the Fred Rogers um, Institute, and so in our fabulous resources for today's webinar, Robin has done a great job giving you all kinds of links to more things about play, and one of them is about the toothpaste theory, which I can't say toothpaste very well uh, for my SLPs that are on the call. So it's this idea that if you were to look, at, and you can do this all when you go brush your teeth tonight. Um, or if it's early where you are when you brush your teeth this morning, um, if you look at the active ingredient on your toothpaste, that there's really usually one active ingredient, and that's oftentimes, depending on your toothpaste, fluoride, um, depending on, you know, all kinds of things. But the way that this is talked about with the Fred Rogers Institute, the colleagues talked about, you know, you might have bubblegum 59 as a flavor, but that's the inactive ingredient. And so, in, in education and early care and development, we have tons of inactive ingredients. We have all these assessments we do. We have curriculum. We have IFSPs. We have IEPs. We have routines-based interviews. Nothing against any of those things, but they're actually the inactive ingredient. They're not the thing that really matters. And you're like, what? We just got done, you know, training on this, and it's really important. And yes, but it's the inactive ingredient. Meaning, without relationships, it doesn't matter which assessment. It doesn't matter how good your IFSP looks like. It doesn't matter. Um, what you do on your home visit, whether you take a toy, whether you don't take a toy. All these big debates we have are all around the inactive ingredient. The only thing that matters is relationships. Now, that said, when the relationship is compromised, that can cause us shark music. It's like, hey, hey, Christy, um, we got to have something else here because this relationship between this mom and this baby is kind of compromised. I've got really, you know, a young mom. Maybe there's drugs and alcohol. Um, maybe there's just um, a difference in temperament. So the mom's an introvert and the baby's an extrovert. Ah, right, this is shark music. So we want to hold that tension. We want to know that the active ingredient is um, uh, this really this this very important thing called relationships. But when we are really thinking about Peter Pan believing in the power of play and we're strengthening relationships, Simultaneously, we have to make sure that we are doing anything we can to identify and remove stressors. 
So this comes from Stuart Shanker's work on um, self-regulation. He talks about five domains of stress. I won't be able to go into depth on this because I do want to get into some of the stages of play today and how you can be a strong play partner, but I want you also to realize that it doesn't matter. I don't want you to um, worry and have shark music when, when something is in the way of the relationship, when something is in the way of play moving. That's okay. Pause, right? Play is on a continuum. Sometimes we pause. Sometimes we go backwards. And so as Misty posted in the chat, the full info infographic uh, of uh, at the Merit Center um, for families and for teachers is these um, this infographic on the five domains of stress. And so the idea today in the webinar is just to help people know that there are these stressors and then begin to have a conversation about how can we remove them. For military families, I'll give you a list of possible stressors, likely stressors. Now, don't let shark music come in too loud, like, how am I supposed to fix that? Awareness is the first thing we do. Just being aware that that stress might be at play helps us understand how the relationship might be impacted. So if a, if a family that is um, facing employment or uh, deployment, sorry, or the family member is deployed, um, you know, the stress goes bi-directional. So for the family member who is um, holding down the fort, quote, unquote, and the family member or family members who are deployed, these stressors are bi-directional. So if there is a family crisis or emergency or even just day-to-day -day stuff like getting getting to a doctor's appointment, paying a bill, putting the trash out, right? People on both sides of the deployment hear the shark music. I, as a person that am not deployed, have to take the trash out. The person who is deployed is like, my partner has to take the trash out. I'm not there to help. I know trash is like a small thing, but it's a compounding thing when every day there's that tug of war between there's something that needs to be done. It doesn't always have to be a big crisis or emergency. It can sometimes be the simple day to day, just get up and get a shower. And knowing that um, there's a family member with kids, five kids under the age of five all at home and you don't have you know, you're the caregiver, who has time to take a shower? So it's that little stuff that becomes the big stuff. So let me keep going. Um, having to miss an important family event. Again, these are on both sides of that deployment will feel the stress. Missing out on a child's growth and development. Keeping the family safe, keeping a child safe. Um, maintaining just the relationship between families and members and friends, finances, the mismanagement, the having enough of funds, being judged or, or feeling like you're going to disappoint. These are huge stressors that most of you probably said, hey, I'm not in the military and I feel those stressors. Right, because we're all human, right? So we're all going to experience those stressors, but our military families are going to feel them perhaps at a heightened level and or a more frequent level. So being able to be aware of them allows us to really step back and say, am I focusing too much on the inactive ingredient and I'm not able to really Peter Pan believe in the power of play through relationships because I'm caught up in all of the inactive ingredient. All right, so that brings us to our second way. So the first way to Peter Pan believe in the power of play is to strengthen relationships and that no matter our role, whatever we do, breath in and breath out, are we fostering the active ingredient? And we do that by sometimes removing those stressors. The second way that we can really Peter Pan believe in the power of play is to really increase our own ability to be a good play partner. So many of us who might do pre-service or in-service you know, that training of other adults, whether it's formal training or informal training or um, a parent support group or a home visit, if we're in the business of helping other adults be good play partners, we have to be really clear in our own mind what it means to be a good play partner. So just as I start to talk about that, what comes to your mind? What do I mean by be a good play partner? What does it look like? So if you want to jump over to the chat or if you're listening to this recording, it's a good chance to pause, take a breath, take a sip of water of your tea, of your coffee. What does it mean to be a play partner? If I saw it, 
What would it look like? What would I hear? What would it feel like if I was the one being a good play partner? So my simplest way as you're thinking about it, there's no right, there's no wrong, so feel free to um, post it. It's, it's what is in your mind, your definition. That's what's important. For me, it's um, using Dan Siegel's uh, phrase that getting neurons to fire together will wire together. So you cannot judge or think what I'm doing is not helpful. <laughs> I used eight double negatives there. If you look at my interaction, so let's say I'm a childcare provider, I'm a mom, I'm a teacher, and you look at me and you're like, is Christy's interaction with this child good or bad for the child? If the neurons are firing, they will wire together. And if I'm promoting my relationship and that relationship I have with the child is allowing neurons to fire, that's being a good play partner. So definitely people are posting things about child choice and being flexible and being present and following their lead and um, being in the moment and not being multitasked and distracted by what's on my phone or what's the shark music, but being there for the child. So absolutely, those are all fabulous ways to think of being a play partner. So if we are going to embrace the, you know, Peter Pan power of play, then what do we do on a day-to-day -day basis, a home visit to home visit, to interaction to interaction with a family, to help them be the very best play partner they can be, knowing that for each play partner, it's going to look different doesn't have to look how I would play. Maybe I really am loud and talk a lot and I'm rough and tumble. And maybe another parent, just that loud noise of having the kids playing and having all the kids running around screaming for joy causes me so much stress that I shut down. So really thinking about how do I match the caregiver's comfort with the child's comfort to be a good match in that play partner situation. So as you think about it, how do you, now that you're sort of saying, oh, this is what it looks like, when you think now full circle, a family's facing stress, let's just say deployment, depression, combat-related injuries, let's just wish there was only one of those in one family, right? But we know many families who are simultaneously facing those stressors. How are we going to support a family to maybe establish maybe more importantly, reestablish a relationship so that they can be play partners. So how do you really see that? That's a big, big question. But I'm going to pause again. And for those of you who are listening online, I would love it if you paused for maybe five, ten minutes and really thought about how do I intentionally help families that are facing these big time stressors of deployment and depression and injuries how do I help them reestablish? What have I done mindfully, with compassion, without judgment, without doing it in my way? Maybe if there's a two-parent or two-caregiver, maybe a grandparent and a young parent, um, maybe um, two moms, maybe a mom and a dad, whatever the co-parenting looks like, how have I intentionally thought about the different styles of those co-parents? Maybe they live together, maybe they don't. What does the style look like if you are establishing a relationship through a mobile device, like through Zoom or Skype, versus a family who's physically there? Yeah, so we're pausing and letting people type and get their thoughts out about that. Yeah, reconnect is another good R-E word, right? Reconnect, reestablish, maybe even repair. Yep, so we're always using those same words we used earlier when we thought about what does play mean to us? Engagement, relaxation, joy. Um, we were coloring the other day. Many of you who know me and have been with me live know that we um, have a workbook of human superpowers, and it's an adult coloring book. And I encourage people to doodle or color. And several of you posted in the chat that you miss coloring and things like that. Um, a, a teacher asked me the other day something like, 
um, was a right way to color the um, piece of paper I had given her. And I just sort of looked at her kind of dumbfounded, like, how could there be a right way to color? And then I sort of had a flashback to those um, days when there were those grocery store coloring contests. I don't know if anybody else remembers those, or maybe we only had them in Idaho. But there was like at the grocery store a worksheet, and then you got to color it, and you did a, a competition or a contest, and then somebody won. Maybe maybe it was other places that people had those contests. But we sort of um, started telling kids that even how you color, right, in the lines, or, oh, the sky is not green. Why can't the sky be green, right? So just out of my own little free association, but um, just kind of thinking about how we think about play and how that's gotten kind of maybe, um, I don't know, tainted over the years. And I love how someone um, posted that part of our job to reestablish relationship is we can be the bridge at time. We can hold that tension. We can be that person who um, is the guide and recognizes um, the challenges, how hard it is to be a good play partner without the stresses. So yeah, great. All right, so third chunk for those of you who are counting down, um, and thanks for all of those who are hanging in there live with me. Those of you who may have fast forwarded, you just hit the third chunk of four chunks. Four chunks, yeah, chunk's not a really technical word, but it's the way I'm thinking about today's webinar. So wanted to take a breath and think about what does it mean to have play skills? So this is now kind of turning our attention to what the kid brings to this um, mix. So we sort of said, um, yes, it's so important that we know early development and that we understand about multiple and varied and that we don't rush things. And we want to Peter Pan believe in the power of play. And so we're going to focus on relationships as the active ingredient. And we're going to really think about how we remove stressors and how how we intentionally and mindfully um, strengthen the relationship so people can be good play partners. Now we're going to think a little bit about um, that zone of proximal development. Where is the kid in their play so that when I enter, when I am being child directed, when I am following their lead, when I am encouraging the child to um, expand their play, that I do that in a way that is a match for them. And so in your resources, again, that my good friend Robin has put together, we've given you different links and there's different milestones. You know, we all know about these different stages of play from solitary to parallel to cooperative. Um, and those are all good. And those of you who teach at the pre-service level, you know, we, we go through and we talk to our students about, you know, how kids learn to play and um, what is a normal or typical sequence of play. Um, we even might put ages on them. Some of you who live in states that might be using Tony Linder transdisciplinary play-based assessment. Um, you know, we put age markers and we talk about milestones and all that good stuff. Not bad. You know, I don't want to say that any of that doesn't have a place. But for me, because play is a part of development and learning, it also adheres to those first what I know to be trues, which means it's going to be highly variable. And the older a kid gets, the bigger that window is when something's going to emerge. And because development is so complicated and interrelated, kids are going to pause and hang out at a stage longer than I want them to, perhaps. And sometimes kids are going to go backwards when something is really novel. So let's say a kid now moves to another military base, or now they move on base, or they're on post instead of being out with us civilians, right? Am I doing good? My military friends talk about on post and off post, right? And so just that transition is in the same city, right? Maybe you're in Fairbanks, Alaska, but now you live off post. That can cause a child to go back, if you will. It's not a regression. It's just typical development that when things change and become too different, I go back to what I know. I go back to what is familiar. So all of these different ways of categorizing play, of looking at sequences of play, of looking at milestones of play, 
they're good for us as play partners to know and be aware of, but also be careful that as we work with families, we don't cause shark music when we talk about, you know, kids that may play differently, especially kids on the spectrum or kids with sensory impairments or kids who are English language learners. There is different sequences of play for kids that have a hearing impairment or a vision impairment than a child who has all of their senses kind of moving along at a pace that we would expect. So while they're important and we've given you good resources, I don't want you to get too hung up on that. So if some of you work with kids with diverse abilities, feel free to comment in the chat about how you've seen um, different progressions of play that weren't a disorder, meaning it was just a different progression um, and that we had to embrace that and say that's just the route the kid's going to go or how many of you know a kid on the spectrum who got stuck. Um, my friend Barb Avila in Portland, Oregon talks about a kid who gets in a loop. They like to do the same thing over and over because it's really predictable and really comforting and really makes all those stressors go away and so how do we enter that child's play? So those are some more important questions. So for me, um, I, as Robin mentioned in my intro, I studied at the University of Oregon. So if we have any ducks on the call, we might uh, have a few of you. I know that I have at least one duck on the call today. Um, but this idea that, um, that what's really critical, what's a really important progression that we learned at the University of Oregon through my work with Diane Bricker was how a child interacts with objects and that it's very telling when I look at a child's play with objects where they are in many parts of their language development, their cognitive development, their self-regulation development, their readiness um, for school even. So as we think about um, this next chunk, I'm going to walk you through um, a typical progression of the interaction with objects and we're not going to worry so much about at what age. Now, most of these that we're going to talk about, if Children's development is progressing um, as we hope, as if the stressors are kept to a minimum. All of these um, ways of playing with objects will be up until the first three years of life. Um, so by the time a child enters maybe a more formal preschool environment, maybe a Head Start classroom, um, maybe even just a community play group, they should have these foundational skills of interacting with objects so they can begin to look to other people as play partners. Oftentimes for our friends that are transitioning maybe from Part C early intervention to 619 or early childhood special ed, it's sort of like leaving Disneyland because now not only are we wanting you to interact with an object, but we want you to share those objects. We want you to play with very complex abstract objects with other kids cooperatively on demand. That's called preschool. Um, so really, we're expecting so much when children enter these um, formal ways of um, gathering kids together that they can now start to look like they're having a delay or disorder or disability when we need to step back and say, how strong are they with their interaction with objects? So one of your takeaways today, and some of you who have met me before, we've talked about this, so it's a good reminder. This is one chunk that you can pull out, and if you take nothing else, um, this might be the chunk for you. And this is really thinking about, um, as a play partner, how do I help children interact with objects? Because this is going to promote their language, their cognition, their social, emotional health and well-being, and not get too caught up in the milestone or the age. So good to know, but don't get stuck there. But really think about the progression itself. So here we go. The first one, um, I for the longest time called this licking and flicking until people told me uh, the images that came to mind as they were thinking about uh, when I said licking and flicking. So sometimes um, I, I do still say licking and flicking as I just did, but this is sensory exploration and this is very, very, very typical. It's even something we do as adults. And you're like, what? When something's unfamiliar to us, let's say someone says, hmm, what is that smell? You deeply breathe in and you're like, oh, I don't know, what is that smell? You're using your senses to explore. What we sort of give up over time is using our senses to explore an object. So we don't lick the object, right? 
But for a baby, we very much assume that the object, their hand, our keys, anything they can get their little grasp onto is going to go straight into their mouth. So this idea of sensory exploration is actually critical and necessary. It's just when you're two or three or four or five that it gets annoying because we have to clean all of those toys, right? So the idea is, is that kids would not get stuck here, that they would move on to the next step. But it's a necessary step. It's an important step. It's something that we want to see and encourage in our youngest of um, citizens is that they are able to really explore their environment using their senses and oftentimes that can be their mouth but it's definitely their ability to look at things their ability to hear things to orient things using those senses so again several of you have posted in the chat that you work with children who might be deaf or hard of hearing or may have a visual impairment. So really thinking about how do we support a child's sensory exploration of objects in ways that make sense for them if they do have some sort of um, sensory um, delay or disorder or impairment. Okay, next sequence in our progression. And again, this is um, probably very common to many of you on the call, but this is something that you can um, support with families and say, this is the typical sequence that, that children will go through um, when they have an object. So don't be surprised if you have your phone sitting out that the kid's going to lick your phone, right? And then if they've moved to simple motor action, they're going to do what with the phone? They're going to bang it. They're going to throw it. They're going to drop it. They're going to pat it. So they're going to do these very simple motor actions of, um, they're quite repetitive. And this is also a fabulous step in development, but annoying when the kid gets stuck here. So when a kid gets stuck in this loop, they just keep lining up their train, and they keep lining up their trains, and they keep lining up their trains. That's a kid who got in a loop. And in later sessions um, of this series, we'll talk more about how to enter the play of a child who's older but got stuck at an earlier stage. But as a play partner, our job is to really think about how am I moving a child into that next sweet spot, or again, as Vygotsky would say, that next zone of proximal development. How do I move you to and away from sensory to simple motor action in a way that is supportive of you? Okay, so then as you move on, you go to the next thing, which is functional use of objects. Now, you don't give the other ones up. Remember, it's, it's interrelated, it's dynamic, it's back and forth, it's pause, it's go. And so just because I start moving into functional use of objects doesn't mean I might not go back and lick something. So you have to be kind of um, aware of that progression and that standing still and that moving back. The question is, when I stall, what do I do about it? And I'll give you a couple of ideas today as well. So being able to use objects for the reason that they were intentionally designed. And this is what um, people will call functional use or um, purposeful use. Now, kids might find their own ways to use objects, but this is really speaking to that we stir with a spoon. We use a book and turn the pages. We even use a block to stack because blocks are really designed for stacking. We use a brush to comb our hair. So these are this um, functional use of things. And then the idea the child moves into representational. And this gets to be really fun with kids. But this can also start to cause some shark music for our families. on military people, meaning kids will use objects to represent and act out things that they've seen, heard, been exposed to, things they've heard their parents talking about. So you might see things here about weapons. You might hear things here that are uncomfortable for those of us that haven't had the trauma of being in war or in a conflict or um, even in the reserves where we're not sure when a family, you know, a family member might need to go do some civil unrest. So this idea that a kid uses a stick as a gun might cause some of us on a home visit shark music, but embracing it and understanding that the kids now at representational play 
helps us go, okay, they're a representational play. This is very common things they've heard, seen, been exposed to. So we need to think about, as a non-military provider of a military family, be aware of our own shark music so we don't, you know, stop this level of play, but that we recognize where that it's coming from and that we allow families to have that freedom to talk about things and to express things that are common in their lives um, in a way that continues to promote the child's play because that's what the child knows in the context of that family. So again, representational is using one object to represent or symbolize another. And then kids start moving into this really fun stuff of imaginary play. Some of us who work in early intervention, early childhood special ed, um, also know that we may have not met kids that have this skill set yet. This is starting to get into really advanced levels of play, but in typical development, you know, you're still young. You're still under the age of three and this is emerging. Um, a couple of people also posted, which is good to, to highlight, that not only may a child use um, something representational, the stick for the gun, um, but it could be a, a detective clue for us that the child is processing something that causes them stress. So many times, um, Dan Siegel and others will talk about um, that kids need to name it to tame it and they need to tell that story of trauma or confusion or something that was scary to them over and over. So even this pretend play um, is really a child processing neurologically um, something that was very traumatic or stressful to them. So this is really an important time for us to figure out how we deal with uh, things like zero tolerance policies that have gone completely overboard in trying to keep our youngest citizens safe and um, not recognizing that this is actually a child's um, body responding to stress and that our job is to remove the stress, not to expel a three-year-old from preschool. But that's a whole other topic, right? But it's good for us to be aware of that and thank you for bringing that up in the chat. Um, and then, as we think about this progression, so we've had sensory motor act, uh, sensory exploration, simple motor action, functional use, representational, imaginary, and then children start to play cooperatively. This is where kids are allowing um, other entities, right, friends and um, peers or siblings to get in there and start to be able to um, interact and take on roles and identities. This is one of the strongest places that kids start to learn self-regulation. So um, a key part of self-regulation is impulse control and the perspective, taking the perspective of others. And kids learn impulse control and taking the perspective of others through pretend play, through cooperative play, where I take on a role or an identity. So I'm going to be um, the mom and you're going to be the sister. It takes impulse control for me to play my role and not your role. And so when we don't allow young children opportunities to engage in pretend play, um, cooperative play in a way that they define it, in the way that they shape it, we're actually um, keeping them from practicing uh, critical elements of self-regulation. So this idea, and I know many of you work with very young children, but soon enough they're going to experience that pressure of being ready for kindergarten. When we have kindergarten and early elementaries that have taken play out and replaced it with tabletop worksheets, we're actually causing kids to become less regulated. They're having fewer of those multiple and varied opportunities to learn how to have impulse control and take the perspective of others. So that's a quick little progression from me to you. So let's pause here because we have about 15 more minutes for those of you who are hanging in there with me live. For those of you who are doing this recording, we have one last chunk to explore. But before we do that, let's do a quick pit stop. Let people scroll through the chat, see what maybe others have posted. Um, and I'll add a new prompt. Can you think of a child who's clearly at one of those stages? So several of you have already reflected that. Um, but can you think of a kid, regardless of age, it's like, oh my gosh, that kid, I can totally see them. Every time I put something on their high chair, they drop it. And they will you know, keep dropping it as many times as I'm willing to pick it up, right? That's a kid who's at that simple motor action where they pat, bang, throw. So again, that progression is sensory, that exploration of my senses, then simple motor, 
functional, then representational, then imaginary, then cooperative. And so keeping in mind, every kid is moving back and forth on that continuum. And as stressors are introduced, and are removed, you will see the kid move in and out. And as a play partner, it's our job to see that as that sweet spot. So that's why it's important that I'm asking you, can you think of a kid who's at that stage? Because play partners need to recognize that. And then those of us who are helping adults, again, when you're that bridge, when you're that guide, it's for us to help other adults become good play partners, to also see that the kid is right there. That's where they are. Now how do we help them begin to take the next step forward? So a child care provider um, may really find a kid um, is super active and runs around the child care um, dumping everything. And so they keep doing a referral saying this kid's acting out, this kid's hyper, this kid needs to go someplace else <laughs> or give me support for this kid. When really this kid is at the simple motor action and all of the centers are cooperative play. It's too big of a leap. So this kid looks like they have a delay disorder disability when we just need to as a play partner examine the environment and say, okay, there's no opportunities for cause and effect. There's no place for this kid to get into sustained play. So they just run from activity to activity dumping because that's where they are developmentally. All right. So again, uh, for those of you who need to hop off, we totally understand. I appreciate uh, those of you who are able to make it the full time. It's a bit. And if you need to just stand up, stretch a leg, uh, that would be great too. Just change uh, even a non-locomotor thing like lean over, twist, raise your arms. It'll help you get through these last 15 minutes. For those of you who are listening to it recorded, um, also pause it. Take a breath. Uh, stand up, move around. Um, motor is so important to all development and learning. All right, so here we are in thinking about, yep, okay, got it, Christy. I believe it. I Peter Pan believe it. I always have Peter Pan believed it. I think I've got a couple of ideas of how I can talk to others, whether that be the infographic, whether that be knowing that the toothpaste um, analogy is going to serve me well, that I'm going to really think about relationships, even if it's just, oh my gosh, the stressors. No wonder nobody's moving on or forward or making progress. We got to move some stressors. Or maybe it was this last little chunk about, wow, there's this this whole progression of just the kids' interaction with play. I didn't say anything about interacting with familiar adults, didn't talk anything about who the agent is in the symbolic play, right? We just talked about interaction with object and walking away with thinking about that progression and that a play partner knows where that kid's um, sweet spot is. So got all that. So again, we'll do deeper dives in future webinars, um, but as we think about um, getting closure today, how can I be a good, strong play partner? So my fourth thing for you was that I wanted you to feel stronger as a result of this webinar that you are a strong play partner. If we are good, strong play partners, then we can more readily train, model, support, scaffold, give ideas to others on how to be a good play partner. So many of you, when I asked you, what does it look like to be a play partner? You had some of the same things that I'm putting here in the bullets. If you're not looking, I'll just state them quickly. Be a match, be a guide, be curious and playful, be a champion of play, and be present. So hopefully you have in your calendar a date with play, and now we're going to be more intentional and say, okay, how am I modeling? How am I scaffolding? How am I supporting, especially for families that have all of these different stressors? How am I going to, for a military family that's deployed, let's say that we're doing during our home visit, we get this luxury of having um, a visit with that family member using Skype or Zoom. What would I do in that precious moment of time to model or talk about or show or allow that parent that there that is there virtually to have an opportunity to be a play partner? Here's your list. Did I create an opportunity for that parent that might be thousands of miles away, both perhaps a little bit mentally, emotionally, and definitely physically, 
how can I help them match their pace and rate with the child's pace and rate? How can I help that parent be a guide for their child's learning? How can I help that parent be curious about what's going on and let some of the shark music? How can I help that parent be a champion of play? Does that make sense? So I'm really saying, how do you intentionally embed a learning opportunity for you to scaffold with a parent that may be or a caregiver that's physically with you, as well as a caregiver who's not? What does that look like? And that's on us to figure that dance out. Even if you don't have the opportunity to uh, connect with the deployed caregiver, how are your conversations going with the family members that are um, on base or um, or still here at, uh, in the United States um, or at home, even if that's at a military base in a foreign country. How are you talking to that family member about how to use that time that they connect using technology? Again, it's a, it's a careful balance between causing more pressure that, oh my gosh, Christy, now we have this 20 minutes or this 10 minutes, not only do I have to bring them up to speed, talk about all the critical things that are going on, but we have to have a play date, Ugh, right? But these are the challenges that serving um, those who serve us, we have to have these conversations about how do I strategically support that family in being a strong play partner. Again, uh, being gentle, thinking about um, TBI, thinking about families who are depressed, thinking about families who are just not in a space right now to be able to take the energy that it takes to be a good play partner, or maybe they are a different play partner than they were before deployment, and being okay um, with that and being um, compassionate with that family to find their new role as a play partner. Uh, maybe hard conversations, but the conversations that um, that is our job to have. Um, it could also be a parent that now finds themselves being a solo parent. So now I have to play um, different roles as a play partner, and I have to be more of a chameleon than I've ever had to. So not only do I have to take out the trash, but I have to be like the play partner that my spouse was or my partner was. So keep those things in mind as you think about home visits and as you think about training and supporting parents. How are we strategically and um, compassionately helping them find their own voice in being a good play partner? And so my last tip for you as you're kind of processing all of that and we'll have one last opportunity for you to reflect this will be the focus I think of our fourth webinar uh, and some of you have heard me talk about the zigzag before but let me give you a takeaway um, practical solution so if you're sitting there going okay Christy I didn't have shark music before this webinar, but now I have shark music, right? Being aware of all these stressors and I don't have control over the stressors and half the time I make a home visit, nobody shows up. What am I supposed to do? Um, one simple way to begin thinking about creating a match, a good play partnership, if you will, uh, of removing a stressor is to think about this zigzag process. So if you're just listening and you can't see it, let me kind of depict for you. There are two columns of phrases. There are seven words. On the left-hand side, there are things that remove or lessen a stressor. On the right-hand side, they are still good things, so I don't want you to think of them as bad things. In fact, stress doesn't mean a bad thing. It's when stress is so much that it becomes a barrier that makes it bad. Sometimes a little bit of stress makes us curious. Stress is like exciting. Stress is novel. Stress um, allows us to learn. It's when there's too much that it keeps us at this hyper arousal um, that it starts to impede. So when you think of too much, as you look at these seven words, you look at a situation and you say, okay, I've got this interaction. Let's go back to that parent laying down, playing with their baby, making silly faces and cooing. And the baby turns away and stops cooing and stops looking. In that very basic human interaction, the baby has said, 
it got too much, right? There were many things going on. You were talking to me. You were making faces. You were making eight different kinds of faces. If anybody's seen me, I make lots of kinds of faces. It got kind of complicated because you started using words. It was abstract because I had to interpret what your facial expressions were a match to your internal emotions. I'm only three days old. It was very specific, the interaction, like I have a turn, you have a turn. Then you introduced something that was unfamiliar. It could have been unpreferred. It was too loud. It was too soft. It was too fast. It was too slow. And of course, whenever it involves you, it adds stress to the kid. So none of that stuff is bad. All of that is good. It just makes it a stressor when I put all of them and the kid's not ready. So something simple you can do in that interaction is you step or zigzag over. So in that interaction, if I can make something single and not multiple. So I'm going to make one silly face, not every silly face that I've ever known to be made. I can keep it simple. So no more language, just nonverbal. I can make it more concrete. So I can describe my emotion as well as make the emotion on my face. I can be global, like you can have six turns and I'll take one turn, or I'll take six turns and you take one turn. It doesn't have to be this precise back and forth. I can do the familiar thing, the thing that you always know that we do back and forth. It's the thing that you love, and I can just then let you have your moment to yourself when that baby disengages, looks away. I don't say, hey, baby, come back to me. I stop, I pause, and I let the baby as well. So that is like the fastest and most furious way that I've ever shared the zigzag. But I want you to have a moment to think about it. And then maybe that is just enough to make you curious and come back to future webinars. But how might you use that zigzag as a way to help you find that sweet spot? So you know a kid who is um, doing imaginary play. When you start to move them into cooperative play, do you get some resistance? Oh, did you zigzag over to the right-hand side and make it too complicated, too abstract, too unfamiliar, too unpreferred, and now you've got some resistance? Can you zigzag over? And so definitely for those of you who are thinking you might use it with families, totally bring it out, print it out, and talk through it. Even if you're at like an IFSP meeting, or you're on a home visit, or there's a concern that the family has raised, or you're trying to create that match, and you can see the mismatch between the caregiver and the child, and everybody's getting a little bit frustrated. You can bring this out. It's the third object and say, when you zig, the kid zags. So you've got to zag when they do so that you're a match again. So it can be a very visual way, and it becomes the third object. So it takes some of that shark music off of, I'm failing, I can't connect, I make it worse, I don't know what to say, I'm, you know, uh, whatever the stressor is, we can start to say, let's look at what might be not only those things that Stuart Schenker's work talks about stressors and recognizing the ones that our families in the military might face, but just as being human, when someone zigzags too fast, too much, too unpredictably, I kind of withdraw. I kind of go back to what's familiar. And so I might need some help scaffolding. So deep breaths in and out. Hopefully, what you have gained today um, is four things. A, better understanding of the importance of play, reminded of it. You've got these ten things we know for sure. We've also kind of very quickly went through that, yes, there are milestones, there are stages, and that's a good guide to help me. But really, I, one of the things I can walk away with is knowing that there's this progression of the interaction with just the object, not to mention with other people, but even with just the object, there's a progression. And that might be some place I can um, land on and help a family land on to really promote and become a strong play partner. And then we are play to so we start to learn to analyze and evaluate, where are you, that zone of proximal development, that sweet spot. Regardless of your age, what's going on? And if you're not moving forward, could it be that your body's responding to stress? Which stressors can we find? Find them. Remove them. For those that we can't remove, maybe we get the zigzag out and go, how can we simplify it? How can we make it more preferred? How can we make it more familiar? And then hopefully the, the thing you walk away with, and maybe you can share 
Um, what's your play date? Because that would be showing that you've got a commitment to fostering strong relationships and play in children. Um, but what we would love to hear from you is what is one thing that you're doing? And I don't know if Robin, if you or um, Coral jump back in to get closure, but I'd like to encourage people to maybe have a little bit of accountability and go straight to the chat before they hit exit the meeting and say, what's one thing that I now am more committed to doing to fostering strong relationships to helping children um, have strong play partners in their life so that they can thrive. So that is my task for you all. And then uh, we'll see how we close this up. All right. Thank you, Christy. Um, we really, really appreciate uh, all of you sharing with us today. Um, and uh, as, as Christy mentioned, if you would uh, give us some feedback here about how you plan to deepen your commitment um, and help foster those strong relationships. Um, also, we are active on social media, uh, and there's going to be some links posted in the chat here in just a minute that will um, direct, oops, sorry, direct you to our social media links. And there will be a post there shortly um, asking you t for that accountability piece about how you're going to, how do you plan to play uh, in the next five to seven days. When you made your calendar date, if you would share with us on Facebook um, when you see that post in the next couple minutes um, or later this afternoon when you're sitting there and doing your thing or this evening and in your me time, how do you plan to play? You can also join us on Twitter and then uh, YouTube where you will find um, a whole host of different webinars that the MFLN has um, produced in the recent months. In addition, we want to invite our MFLN service providers, such as DOD, branch services, guard and reserve service providers, and cooperative extension professionals to continue the discussion in our private and moderated LinkedIn group. You can click on the link to join the group, or you can send us an email, and we look forward to hearing from you. <clears throat> Please plan to join us for the next webinar in this series with Christy on play on June 22nd at 11 a.m. Eastern. During this session in June, Christy will focus on viewing authentic assessment as the means by which we get to know children and foster their development and learning. Recommended practices and research on how to assess children during play will be provided. Webinar participants who want to receive CE credit or want proof that they participated in the training need to take an evaluation and post-test. The link to that will be provided in just a moment. These certificates of completion will be automatically emailed to you once you've completed the evaluation and post-test. However, this can sometimes take up to 24 to 48 hours and sometimes even longer for it to generate. So, um, if you do not receive a certificate within several days and you've checked your spam folder to make sure that they're there, or that they're not in there, um, go ahead and send us an email at the email address on the screen and we can um, help you obtain that. I think they're going to put that email address in the chat. But for those who can't see the chat, that address is mfln fd at early intervention, so that there's no mistaking, because I can't even speak right now. Um, I, it is, I, I'm very tongue-tied. Those that claim EICE credit will need to check with their credentialing agency to determine if there are any additional materials you must submit to receive credit. Those materials would be available on the Learn Event page. A copy of the slides is at the Learn Event page. When you receive your email with your certificate, there will be a copy of those post-test questions and your answers in there. And some agencies will request that you submit that. And also remember that if you're in a state other than those on the slide, sometimes other state and professional licensure boards recognize the credits we supply, but you'll need to check with your agency. The link for the evaluation and the post-test is provided in the chat and it's also on this screen. Please be aware that you might need to copy and paste the link instead of just clicking on it. It may not work for you just when you click on it. You would need to uh, paste it into your browser window. Um, I noticed a question about if there's social work CEs avail CEUs available. We do not offer NASW credits um, in early intervention. In addition to the Family Development Early Intervention Team, the Military Families Learning Network consists of several other concentration areas that provide resources and or professional development for those working with military families. 
those different areas are listed there on the screen. And more information about those uh, and what they have to offer can be found at the link there on the slide or that's being posted into the chat. I want to thank you all for being here today, for actively participating in the chat. We hope that you have gained something significant from today's presentation and that we will see you again on June 22nd at 11. If you missed anything or have any questions for us, please email us at mflnfdearlyintervention at gmail.com. We thank you again for being here, and we look forward to uh, our webinar in June. And again, many thanks to Christy for uh, just a wonderful presentation. Well, thank you, Robin, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thanks, Robin, and thank you, Christy, once again. I uh, also want to say thank you to all of our participants today. What a lively discussion we had. It was so nice having you. Uh, we will leave the room open for another few minutes in case you need to grab any contact information or links from the chat pod. Uh, if you'd prefer just to send us an email, if you need, have any questions about CEUs or the content today, uh, please feel free to do so. And we hope to see you at another MFLN learning opportunity in the near future. Uh, just a heads up, there was, uh, I believe it was Mary Jo who asked if uh, social work credits were offered for today's webinar. Uh, the answer is no. However, we do have social work credits offered by both military caregiving in the family development uh, concentration area. So if you head over to the link that you see on the slide right here, militaryfamilies.eextension.org slash webinars, you will be able to find more information about those. So. We wish you a wonderful afternoon. We hope to see you again uh, in June or at another MFLN webinar in the near future.